Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show on this February 12th, 2023, a Sunday. Well, the saga continues with the UFO business. Uh, <laughs> they shot down three, I guess, over northern Canada and, and Alaska. And uh, what they describe as cylindrical objects. And uh, gosh only knows what in the heck's going on because now we got one in China too. Uh, Global Times reported that the UFO was flying over the Yellow Sea in the Guangdu port area. And I guess the Chinese are preparing to shoot it down. Another one over China. It's getting kind of weird, guys, in the last 24 hours. Anyway, today's story time. Well, we're going to change our setting from all this craziness that's going on right now. And we're going to move back in time, back into the early 1970s, you know, or maybe 1970, you know. And, uh, you know, the time, what times were like back then? <laughs> you know? Good times. Back when we had uh, freedom. <laughs> Back when we had uh, a, a U.S. Constitution, <laughs> you know, that provided freedoms. And uh, so, I, just, I don't know, can I get that? I'd have to move this up a little. Anyway, that gas price on there, just behind my head there, is 30 cents a gallon for gas. And those are the days, you know, when you could drive a real car. <laughs> A car that had some had some metal in it, you know. Back in those days, you know, you could you could walk on the hood of your car and you wouldn't leave any dents. We're talking cars that were well made, you know. V8s and six cylinder was considered to be a small car <laughs> back in those days, you know. Uh, the days of the rear wheel drive, those were the good days. The days when cars had rear wheel drive. And you guys are a little bit older, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So anyway, that's our setting in Florida. You can see, and this is a picture from Florida, and you know in the background you got the trees and you get Spanish moss hanging off of them. Spanish moss is a sign of the south. And there's no place like the southern United States, the southeast. It's a wonderful place. It's a magical place, especially back around the 1970s. So anyway, getting back to our story. My grandfather and, gra and, and my, my father were building a house in Ormond Beach, Florida. And uh, they were getting quite a ways on building this house. It was cement blocks and they had the roof on it already. And they were working inside building the bedrooms and stuff. Well, it was quite a little drive, you know, over to where my grandfather's trailer house it was. Uh, over in uh, near D just the other side of Deland, Florida. It was about 20 or 30 miles you know and so a lot of times my father and my grandfather were tired at night and they started sleeping inside the house even though it wasn't finished even though it didn't have any uh, carpets or anything like that you know and back in those days carpets were very popular the carpet that was most popular was a carpet called shag carpet so that's what they decided to put inside the house was shag carpets and I remember my grandfather, he had one of these, he learned how to lay carpets, you know, and he was cutting the carpets and he was putting them down. It didn't have the baseboards on yet. And he had this thing that I used to like to play with, this tool he bought for installing carpets. On one end of it, it was shaped like a, it had like teeth on it that would dig into the carpet. And then you had, it had a knee kicker on the other end of it with a big soft pad on it lay it down on top of the carpet and he'd give it a kick with his knee and it would stretch the carpet onto these other little tack like strips that had these little hooks on them and the carpet would hook into these little wooden strips that, and the first they had to lay down this underlayment underneath the carpet you know and my grandfather would go around and kick it in you know and they, he was, they were working on the carpets inside the house and at night they would just pull an old mattress out on the floor and sleep on the floor inside the house. And this is during a time period when I was sleeping in this thing I call a cam clam box out on the roof of the car. Well, my mother 
And my grand, I think the I think the ba house had either was a two bath or a three a three bedroom or, or a two bedroom. I'm not sure. It might have been a two bedroom. But anyway, my parents were sleeping in the same house in one bedroom, and my grandparents were sleeping in the in the opposite bedroom. And I, I you know, there's a lot of kids up and down that street. And you know, being as I was in fourth grade. It was something similar, if you can imagine it in your mind, to the Little Rascals, you know, on the show The Little Rascals. The kids were like, oh, we were always playing up and down the street. I was riding my bicycle up and down the street in front, or the kids were uh, building these things they called forts. There's about three or four boys there, me and self included, you know. We were always building these things called forts where we'd dig a hole down underneath the sand and we'd cover it with a piece of plywood and pour and put earth on top of the plywood and it'd be like a, a it's called an underground fort. And we also had what we called tree forts where we basically put a sheet of plywood between some branches and stuff and nailed it down and, and you know, it's just like a little little tree house sort of a thing. You play cowboys and Indians over in the woods on the other side of the street, you know. And uh, we cut uh, cut branches off of the little palm trees and stuff. And we did a lot of playing over there with these other kids, you know, in Ormond Beach. And I went to school there. They enroll, enrolled me in school. So I remember one day at lunch... They said that they some hunter had donated to the school a whole bunch of opossum meat. And the school cook, I think it was 30, 40 pounds of opossum meat. And the school cook had, uh, had taken the meat and prepared it, and she had made it into sloppy joes for all the kids in the school. You know, that was about the best sloppy joes I ever had. Those were the good old days back when back when they could do things like that. You know, I mean, it was perfectly legitimate back in those days, you know, to uh, if they had some extra meat on hand to, to serve it to the kids, even though it wasn't, quote, unquote, the legitimate hamburger of the day. Uh, nowadays, I have the legitimate hamburger of the day, but it might be mixed with crickets or gosh knows what, you know, bug meal or goodness knows what. So, uh, I prefer those old days back when we used to have real meat. But anyway, I'm straying from the topic, story. So, we, we were over in Delta, uh, Ormond Beach and, and got this house all built. And in the end, my grandfather and grandfather sold it for a tidy profit and they split the profit between them. And they give uh, half of the money went to my dad and half of the money went to my grandfather. Now, uh, it was quite a tidy sum of money back in those days that my dad had. So my dad bought himself a lot, not far away from my grandfather's place. A lot of land. It was a quarter acre. And, uh, and he started to build this house for himself, for my family, you know. And uh, I was, this was a couple years later. I mean, I think I was in like fifth or sixth grade when they were building this house out in Lake County. And uh, so my dad was, he put the slab in and it, day he was doing the slab, you know, the slab was concrete and everything, and he got the concrete crock in, and he did it all himself. He poured it all out and everything, the whole thing. It was, uh, I think it was uh, 24 feet by 36 feet size slab. Put the concrete bolts in, he was all troweling it off and everything. And my mother was there, and, and the family was there. We were there, but we weren't helping much. It was my dad who was doing most of the work. And he just had an old board that he was using to trial the cement off with. And he had this long paddle that he made for himself out of wood with a long handle on it, made out of some two-by-fours. I think he had split the two-by-fours in half. I think he took like a, maybe a two-by-four by 16, and he had sl slided it in half to a two-by-two so two by 16. And then he had 
taken and nailed a flat board on the end of it so that he could reach out onto the concrete and go back and forth and paddle the concrete out smooth. So it was a hot day that day, and he worked all day smoothing this, smoothing it and smoothing it. Got just to where he liked it. Oh, boy, isn't this nice? You know, I got it all nice and smooth. And he was really happy. This is, you know, I looked at my mother. He says, oh, look, look how nice and smooth I got. They worked all day at it. And this one little cloud off in the distance appeared. And it got darker and darker, this one little cloud. And it grew darker and darker. And it came overhead. And it poured so, rain so hard, you wouldn't believe it. The, the drops were bouncing off of the cement three feet in the air, these great big drops. Just poured and lightning. And it pitted my dad's cement job. And one, one cloud, every place else was sunny. It was just directly overhead, this one cloud. And my dad was hopping mad. He was so mad... He threw the cement trowel across the thing, and he tried to smooth it. He got out there right away, and he started trying to smooth it. By that time, he could walk on it. But it was just too much for him to smooth it all. So I remember him coming in, you know, later, my dad, and he would make this mixture he called parge, <laughs> which was mostly Portland cement mixed in with a little bit of sand and made it, like, creamy, creamy-looking stuff and he was over there on the baddest spots on the slab going over it and over it with this Portland cement trying to smooth it out you know Get right it. <laughs> so anyway we started building so my dad you know he uh, he got in there and uh, he started putting the walls up and he never put any windows in he just put the wall up just straight wall right across all four sides, the out exterior walls. And then he boarded it right in with plywood on the outside. But on the inside, he had the windows framed in. But the plywood was right over the windows. So I'll always remember my dad sitting up on top of the wall, you know, after he got the walls up and he had the ladder there next to, next to him, you know. And he was sitting up on top of the wall with his hammer, and he was banging his hammer and working consistently steady, you know. And this guy he knew drove by in the road out front. I was standing next to the house watching all this. The guy drove by, and the guy leaned his head out the window, and he says, What are you doing there, Travers? Are you building a fort for Armageddon? <laughs> My dad laughed and waved, you know, from on top of the wall. <laughs> Because it had no windows in it. He said, what are you doing, building a fort for Armageddon? So anyway, the guy drove on by. So my dad continued to work. And my dad got me to help him a lot, you know. He was teaching me how to nail. How to nail board. And I got pretty good at it pretty quick, you know. Because I was getting to be a bit of a big boy then. You know, I was like in fifth grade. I think I was about 10 or 11 years old. My dad started teaching me things like when he started to put the wiring into the house, he started to teach me how to... Uh, and back then, a person could do their own wiring. Uh, they didn't have to hire an electrician. You, you could homeowner could do everything back in those days on building a house. And my grandfather taught my dad how to do wiring on the house he built in Ormond Beach. He showed my dad how to do it, and he got my dad to help. So then my dad was showing me how to do it, you know, and he got me to wire all the outlets. Strip the wire, bark the wire off, how to twist it around the, pl the pr plugs on the prong, and how to tighten it up, you know, on the, on the duplex receptacle. You know, and, and how to push it, push it in, and how to get it ready for inspection and everything. And he got me to do all those, all the outlet boxes, and all the light switches, you know, while he was... My dad was doing other things like insulation and things like that. My dad put all these roof trusses on and he built them out of spruce, two by fours, because at that particular moment in time, they ran out of southern yellow pine, two by fours, stores. The spruce, the spruce was a little bit cheaper anyway. I think the southern yellow pine back then used to be 99 cents a piece for a stud. And he was getting, I think, these spruce studs for 79 cents. 
So there were two by four by eights and twelves and whatnot, you know. And, and so my dad built these trusses. He did a very good job building the trusses. So he put all the trusses up, you know, on the roof. And he got up there and he nailed the plywood on and he put the, all the shingles on and he put all the all the edge, the water drip around the edge and everything and had the roof all nice and roof tight and everything. And he called for a framing inspection from the inspector. So the inspector come out and looked at it. And he said to my dad, he says, you got to tear this roof off. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you what. Can you just imagine knowing what my dad was like, what a livid fit my dad was in <laughs> when the inspector said, you got to tear this roof off. My dad said, why? Why have I got to tear the roof off? Are you kidding me? My dad was so upset he was just spitting. The inspector says, well, he says, you didn't use the right kind of studs. He said, you used, uh, you used spruce studs. He said, you're supposed to use southern yellow pine. You know, and, and the inspector quoted him and says, right from the, right from the, the Southern Standard Building Code, you got to do this this way. My dad says, no, 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 you, you can't tear this roof down. You kidding me? And they were a big upset, you know, so my dad was all upset that night. Couldn't even eat. My mother says to him, why, why don't you call up the county and, and get the chief inspector and talk to the chief inspector? My dad says, well, what do you mean, talk to the chief inspector? She says, well, maybe he can do something for you. Maybe you won't have to tear the roof off. Well, my dad says, oh, that won't work and stuff, you know. So the next day my dad got on the phone and he, called, he did what my mother said. He said, call the chief inspector. The chief inspector said, okay, I'll come out and take a look at it. So my dad was there, and the chief inspector came out, and he took a look at it. And he says, uh, okay, he says, Mr. Travers, he says, uh, well, he says, uh, he says, you did use the wrong kind of studs. He said, but you did a good job on this roof. He said, these are nice-looking trusses, and they're all, they're accept very acceptable-looking job. He said, but you did use the wrong kind of studs, he said. He said, the inspector is correct. You did use the wrong kind of studs. But he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, if you put a brace in here and a brace in here and a couple braces in here, he said, he said, and put this here and put this here like this to add a little bit of extra strength, he said, I'll have him a pass uh, place. My dad was like, okay. My dad was like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'll put, I'll put the brace in where you said. Okay, okay. So they left, right? And they came back. So the same inspector came back. I guess they talked, you know. Same inspector come back in to look at it. He said, did you put the braces in the chief inspector told you? Yes, here they are, sir. Yes, here, 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 here. Braces are in. Look, look, look. Yeah, okay. I'll pass it for you then. So they passed it off. But you know that roof that was built like a, built really well. I mean, it was nothing wrong with the, because all through the northeast and all everywhere they use, that's what they use now is, is, is uh, spruce studs to to that was just a little thing that they had in the building code back there around 1970 where they had a, a ma much available much availability to southern yellow pine and they didn't have much availability to spruce so they kind of put that I guess in the building code it has to be yellow pine but I think they've taken that since taken that out anyway it caused my dad an awful lot of headache but there's a few other things, you know, building the house too, where he had headaches and he had to strip things out and reapply them. Uh, but anyway, he got the house built and we moved in. Nice little three bedroom, two bath, small three bedroom, two bath, you know. I think originally it only had one bathroom, but it was, it was a nice little house to grow up in. But I had to go to school over in, over in Umatilla. That's where I was going to school then that particular time you know and Umatilla was a rough school what I mean by a rough school is they used to bust boys in from the from the uh, a couple youth facilities uh, boys ranches and stuff where, where young juveniles would be sent they used to call it juvenile home or juvenile 
I forget what they used to call it back in those days, but basically young men who were, and, and they used to use them at that school on the football team. So anyway, it was kind of a rough school where I went to school. And I started growing up in that house, you know, and it was a nice place to live. Uh, anyway, there's a lot going on this weekend, guys. Uh, that's enough of the story time, but what I'm going to tell you is now is, is there's a lot going on this weekend. And there's a lot going on. Uh, I'm, I'm very suspicious there might be something going on behind the scenes with all this spy balloons and all this. Keeping my eye on it, the situation, but it seems to be a developing situation. I don't believe the things that the government tells us. Uh, nowadays, they don't want to panic the people so much they don't tell the people the truth anymore. And are these really UFOs? I, I question. I question everything the government tells us now, base. You know, but the only source of information that we mostly have is 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 mainstream news. And I, I mean, don't you kid yourself? You know, you get a lot of these guys out there who are saying, "Oh, this is the only source for information that's not mainstream." Well, the mainstream news carriers are the ones out there who have who have reporters on the scene on an awful lot of these world events. And if you can't rely upon them, how then how are you supposed to find out what's actually happening in the world? And this is a real pity in this modern day and age that we can't trust the mainstream media. Uh, we can't trust their newsworthiness. And it puts, puts us all in peril. That's one of the things that puts us in peril is not having accurate news. Uh, personally, I think that it's in the best interest of, of the country and in the best interest of everybody involved if the mainstream news starts to uh, change themselves back to uh, honest and integrity in the reporting uh, so that we can have verified news and not subterfuge. And so when I see all of these... Uh, stories about UFOs flying around out there uh, I find that hard to believe that, 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 that is, especially with the geopolitical events occurring with the war going on and everything and the tensions between us, we East and West during this period in time I mean oh, look at all those years we had between if you talk about the UFO phenomenon going back to the Roswell event of 1947 all the way up until the present you know, uh, that's about, what, 80 years. 80 years of basically not much going on in the, U in the category of, of unidentified flying objects. And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 this. Just in the timing of world events where we got the tensions going on between East and West makes me suspicious of what's going on. And then I hear this story about, okay, it's UFOs. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, you know, with the geopolitical events going on right now, is it really UFOs or some sort of a subterfuge that where they're pulling the wool over our eyes from something else? Like saying it's one thing when it's really something else. I don't really, in other words, I don't really trust them. Now, what am I trying to say here? I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say here. All, all I know is I don't completely trust our government any longer. I don't trust the news media any longer. I think it's about high time that they started gaining our trust back by being trustworthy rather than being a bunch of... What can I say? Anyway, listen, guys. Have a great weekend, and we'll catch you guys Monday morning with... I'm going to keep following these stories, plus the story of the, of the biggest story of all, which is people aren't reporting on it very much, is that the whole system, is financial system, is on the verge of collapse right now. We got banks that are in big trouble. I just heard this morning about Bank of America, the Swiss Bank, and all these banks. And, you know, I mean, 
we could get some sort of a banking collapse coming along on the heels of everything else we have going on. I just see it one way. The, they're squeezing the people tighter and tighter. It's not like it was in the good old days. Remember in the good old days when things were stable? Like this picture behind me right here. Nowadays, they're squeezing people tighter and tighter. And sooner or later, as they keep squeezing people, they're going to react. And I think the thing that's going to make them react is when things get bad enough and there's enough fear out there, the people are going to react. And, you know, when people react all of a sudden like that, generally it's an overreaction. But it's a massive reaction. Anyway, and I've pointed this out in my show. I call it a human stampede. I think it's coming when there's enough fear in the system. And what can generate fear? Well, things flying into your airspace that are not UFOs. Okay, we'll catch you guys in the next show. Bye-bye.